Good. Welcome, uh, everybody, and welcome to our guest today, uh, Michelle O'Neill, Vice President of Sinn Féin, leader of the party in the North, and a member of the Orth Corla. Um, Michelle has been involved in politics for most all, all <coughs> of her adult life. Uh, first female mayor of Dungannon, MLA since 2001, and a number of ministerial roles in the executive. So without further ado. Okay, that was very quick. <laughs> Thanks. Well, good afternoon, and uh, great to, to be here this afternoon and have a chance to address you all, and I look forward to uh, the questions afterwards. Um, this is my first time here, actually, so uh, great, great to be here and, and to see so, so many people um, on the topic of what I want to talk about today, which is around Ireland's future and beyond Brexit. So I'm very grateful to the Institute to afford me the opportunity to have a chance to, to actually address, address the gathering. Um, I think that as we gather here today, Ireland's probably facing um, its biggest and probably its most profound challenges in a generation, not least in the context of Brexit, but also because of demographic change and also because of the loss of the Unionist majority in the North. And then aligned to all of that is the fact that there is an evolving conversation around the future of the constitutional position on the island, and Brexit has clearly become a catalyst for all of that. So I think as we, as we gather here um, today, history is certainly unfolding all around us. I think it's a matter of vital national importance, which requires um, intelligent, mature, and inclusive analysis and examination. And it also demands proper planning for the future. The world is moving on, and it will move on very quickly. So the question for us all in politics, in government, in business, academia, and civil society is, how do we best shape Ireland's future direction for the betterment of everyone who shares this island together? We're certainly in uncharted territory as a country, and how we respond to all of these challenges will determine our path for decades to come. The Brexit referendum in 2016 did not take account of Ireland or the unintended consequences for our institutional or constitutional arrangements. The political, social and economic progress of the last 21 years was ignored. The relations developed within the North, across the island and between Ireland and Britain have been stretched. Brexit is a British policy which is being foisted on part of this island and our people who have not consented to it at all. We value our membership of the European Union because it has brought us enormous benefits, both financially and politically, uh, down through the years. The people of the North voted to endorse this support during the 2016 referendum by opposing Brexit. The majority of citizens and elected members to the Assembly are utterly opposed to Brexit, and there is no good version of Brexit for Ireland, North or South. Ultimately, dragging the people of the North out of the EU into a nightmare is mutually incompatible with the Good Friday Agreement. So we identified the need to provide an Irish solution to an English problem. And actually, former president of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, in this very building actually launched our response to all of that whenever he launched our document here, which was entitled Designated Special Status for the North within the EU back in 2016. We have worked constructively with the Irish government and the pro-Remain Assembly parties in the North, including the SDLP and the Alliance and the Greens, to work in common cause towards in defence of our shared interests. We also secured cross-party consensus in the Dáil back in February 2017 for our policy. And the core tenets of that policy have been to advance the case for safeguarding the peace process and the protection of the Good Friday Agreement, no customs border checks and tariffs on this island. Continued access to both single market and customs union. Preserving the north, south, east, west elements of the agreement, which are critical to cooperation and better integrated collaboration economically and in public service provision. And to secure citizenship provisions core to the Good Friday Agreement, which recognises the birthright of all people of the north to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both. As they, may, they, as they may so choose, and therefore exercise and enjoy their Irish and EU citizenship and associated rights. So I suppose the question is, is last week's 
revised political declaration an Irish protocol good for Ireland. We believe that whilst it's clearly imperfect, it is better than a no-deal crash-out. I've described it as the least worst outcome. Does it achieve what Sinn Féin and others have been arguing for in regards to special status? Yes, it does. It means no border, and critically, what it means is no unionist veto. The DUP have been uh, attempting to conflate the issue of the principle of consent, which is set out in the Good Friday Agreement on the constitutional status of the island, with the issue of parallel consent, which is in reference to the workings of the Assembly and the Executive, and is limited to a number of areas, for example, when it comes to the setting of a budget or the election of a Speaker, which was a relevant matter over the course of yesterday's debacle in the Assembly. The deal on the table will mean that seamless trade and all Ireland supply chains will be less disrupted. It will protect trade, jobs and livelihoods, and it's clearly welcome. There are issues in terms of it. The role and consent required by the Assembly every four years is imperfect because it doesn't allow businesses to plan into the future. It doesn't give, them, they give their investors certainty. Our island economy has conventionally been depicted as a product of our political history. That is segregated and divided, with the South outperforming the North. We now see the reverse of what was done, or what was once a vibrant Northeast economy on this island, when partition occurred and boundaries were drawn. Belfast was the industrial anchor, having emerged from the Second World War in a relatively advanced, advanced uh, advantageous position. But that's the bygone era, and things have changed. The divergence between North and South has often meant competing economies and the North continually trying to catch up, despite the peace dividend and all the foreign direct investment post-1998. I firmly believe that we need to develop and nurture, we need to build and grow the all-island economy, where we develop closer regimes and models of integration. It's imperative that the island of Ireland redoubles our efforts to develop and rebuild modern, competitive and sustainable economy, where we open doors to trade, to investment, tourism and to jobs. We need to improve our competitiveness through investing in public services and infrastructure on an all-island basis. Our membership of the EU went some way to compensate for the shortfall, with substantial financial aid towards infrastructure, agriculture, subsidies and other grant aid. This island together has been in the EEC and the EU respectively since 1973, and the Tories and the DUP are intent on dragging us out of the EU, and there's huge anger about that right across the north. What we must take away from all of this Brexit uh, debate and debacle is that we cannot ever allow others to make decisions for our country, for Ireland, and for our future. So we must decide Ireland's future beyond Brexit, and Ireland's future must be in Ireland's hands only. And all the while, as we go on that journey, we must be guided by the principles of the Good Friday Agreement. Sinn Féin, along with others, have invested heavily a serious amount of energy and political capital in the peace process. The Good Friday Agreement framework, in all of its dimensions, is something that we're fully committed to. Our agreement, the People's Agreement, has been under fierce uh, attack by hard Brexiteers, and I do not expect that to end anytime soon, because as we know, Brexit is here for keeps. The agreement provided an alternative to conflict, and it was the basis for building a new and democratic society, and the peace and reconciliation of a deeply divided society. And I think we have to reclaim that spirit of the Good Friday Agreement. We must not lose the last chance to advance reconciliation and heal the wounds of the past. A central part of that agreement is human rights and equality guarantees in law. The DUP, against the will of the majority of parties, MLAs and the electorate, have yet to embrace these guarantees. And we, Sinn Féin, are committed to the restoration of the Good Friday Agreement institutions on a firm, fair and just basis in the coming period. But this must be based on respect, full respect for and protection and expression of the rights and identities of one another's traditions, which even-handedly afford our communities the parity of esteem, respect and equality of treatment and opportunity promised in the Good Friday Agreement. Momentum in talks since April of this year has been impeded by two political realities, Brexit being one and the Tory DUP pact at Westminster being the other. But we must return to the negotiating table because progress always has been possible. We need to guard against what is a lull 
so that it doesn't become a full stop. The continued stalemate, I believe, is untenable, it's unsustainable, and it's quickly running out of road. It's no secret that we are in course. We, of course, are as Irish Republicans, and we're a party whose raison d'etre and primary objective is to bring about a new and agreed Ireland. We are the largest nationalist party in the North, representing our citizens, and we are committed to the democratic pathway to a united Ireland, as subscribed to in the Good Friday Agreement. And we're also wholly committed to the principle of consent. It will only be the people, it will be the people alone who decide our constitutional future through a unity referendum. The fulcrum of the Brexit crisis is the border in Ireland. This has exposed the failure and the undemocratic nature of partition, a political problem which requires a political solution. There is a growing sense that circumstances are now rapidly changing, which will inevitably lead to the final breakup of the constitutional structures of the United Kingdom. People from across society in the North, including those with a British identity, are now seriously questioning the merits of which union they wish to belong and where their economic interests are best served. Over the past number of elections in the North, the unionist majority has gone. That notion of a perpetual unionist majority, the very basis of partition, is gone. The latest census data on the North from 2011 show significant democratic, demographic shifts where the nationalist population will soon be a majority as early as the end of the next decade. A conversation is now underway on the constitutional future of the whole island. That's a conversation that's never been seen before. While the devolution settlement ushered in by the Labour government back in 1998 was a Welsh, Scottish and Irish phenomenon, how we reached this point and our point in Belfast was very different and historically painstaking. We're not the same as Scotland and Wales. The issue of, issue of Irish unity has taken on a whole new dynamic because of Brexit and that can't be ignored. The political momentum and change is moving in that direction. Sinn Féin wants a new and agreed Ireland. However, let's be clear, we never claim to own the debate by ourselves. The debate is for each and every one of us. And I think the key point in that debate is actually that the EU have declared in the future that in the event of Irish reunification, the North will automatically rejoin the EU. So the declaration by the EU states that the European Council acknowledges that in accordance with international law, the entire territory of such a united Ireland would thus be part of the European Union in the event of Irish reunification. Those of a British Unionist identity are starting to assess what this means, not because they wish to become Irish nationalists, but simply because they want to remain Europeans. It's no longer self-government from Westminster through devolution, through devolution that people are content with. Everyone is being challenged to rethink their future. Sinn Féin, for our part, see no contradiction whatsoever in declaring our firm commitment to power sharing with unionism in the Stormont Assembly, whilst also initiating a mature and inclusive debate about new political arrangements which examine Ireland's future beyond Brexit. And similarly, I believe there's no contradiction in unionism working the existing constitutional arrangements whilst taking its rightful place in the conversation about what a new Ireland would look like. Citizens are looking to the future to see where their interests are best served. The people of this island should have a choice between Brexit and reunification. A growing number of people on the island of Ireland believe that Irish unity is the democratic alternative to the unwanted Brexit that's being foisted upon citizens here. And we cannot afford to compound segregation and division and isolation. There is an onus on the Irish government to begin such preparatory work now in parallel with civic society and conversations which have already started. Emerging voices across civic society in the North are now discussing this option both publicly but also quietly in workplaces and in homes. So how do we help our neighbours from a Protestant British Unionist identity into this conversation without having to surrender that identity or allegiance? Because the new Ireland that I certainly want to bring about isn't one that's just for nationalists or republicans. It has to be one for everybody who shares this island and everybody must feel that they belong. In considering this, we should remember that the North would be uniting with a pre-existing state within the EU, where Article 3 of Bunrock Nahern anticipates reunification, and in the context of an international agreement that guarantees continuity of protections established within the Good Friday Agreement. And I think that's a really important point. 
there has to be a continuity of the Good Friday Agreement. All of the mistakes made during the Brexit referendum must be avoided in any national dialogue and referenda on the constitutional future of Ireland. It's clear that the building of a new and agreed Ireland will require the participation and the cooperation of all of the people of this island. In particular, it's evident that the people, parties and government in the South must commit themselves to this objective. However, Britain must also accept its obligations to create the conditions which allow this process to begin in the context of the Good Friday Agreement provisions. The British government have a legal duty to join in developing the necessary processes that will recognise these realities and give effect to these requirements as agreed and to make the required investment of political will. So the British and Irish governments should enter into discussions to create the framework and the atmosphere necessary for this purpose. It would assist in preparing for negotiations if discussions between the governments were to take place prior to any referendum and avoid the repeat and the abject failure to begin basic pl planning that was so evident throughout uh, the Brexit debate. And the Irish government should clearly press for such an engagement. The British Irish Intergovernmental Conference, as contained within the Good Friday Agreement, is a mechanism to facilitate such a discussion. The conference, as you are aware, was set up under the Good Friday Agreement to promote bilateral cooperation between both governments. Costing reunification, carrying out an examination of the new political arrangements, fully respecting obligations and commitments under the Good Friday Agreement is also crucial. This also should include any outstanding commitments under the agreement and the steps to be taken to implement them in advance of a referendum. A national forum must be established to carry this necessary engagement and consultation forward led by, bo by the both, both of the governments. The Irish government should also establish a constitutional unit within government and appoint a minister with responsibility for North-South relations, political dialogue and negotiation, planning and preparation for a referendum on Irish unity. When an Irish unity referendum is secured and won, there also must be a period of preparation for the island of Ireland to become a reunified country. Setting a realistic reunification date will allow time for preparations necessary for the national parliament to take on the new powers of reunification to be completed. This period between the referendum and reunification will see further negotiations between Dublin, London and importantly the European Union. The governments as agreed in the Good Friday Agreement are committed to work together constructively in light of the outcome of the referendum in the best interests of the people of the island of Ireland. And following that vote on reunification, agreements will be needed between the Irish and Westminster governments setting the parameters for Ireland's transition to reunification. These will set out the precise timetable towards that reunification. There are also ways in which the EU could ensure that the transition to Irish unity and maintaining membership of the EU are supported. And I think the most uh, poignant example of that is how the EU helped Germany. Next month marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall in the night of the 9th of November. This symbolised the end of the Cold War and set in chain a motion of events that would ne forever change the face of Europe. And as a direct cons consequence, Germany was fully unified in one year, in less than one year. And that's something for everybody to think about because sometimes events can overtake you. The European Union has always been about removing barriers, about bringing people together in peace and prosperity. Professor Colin Harvey and barrister Mark Bassett published a new paper relating to this only a fortnight ago in the European Parliament. This could involve the establishment of a European Parliament Special Committee on Reunification, as was the case in German reunification. This parliamentary committee would have the ability to deal with all issues relating to the impending reunification and the reintegration of the North into the EU. Also, the European Parliament has the ability to establish what's known as a contact group, which would maintain contact with political parties, public authorities, civil society in the North with a view to ensuring the widest possible range of groups are heard. In order to ensure the representation of citizens from the North, the existing MEPs may be designated an observer members, as observer members using the precedent both of observer MEPs from the new lander in Germany and newly accepted member states of the EU. Only an Irish government and an Irish parliament will put the interest of the Irish people first. The chaos at Westminster where no heed is taken to the interest of either Ireland or Scotland is a daily reminder that our interests do not matter to the English. The Good Friday Agreement 
gives the people here the opportunity and the choice to decide our future together. How we live together, how we work together, and how we share this island together. The political momentum and change is moving in that direction. Not only is it possible, but I believe it's inevitable in the time ahead. Brexit is a serious, direct threat to Ireland's future, political stability and economic prosperity. So these challenges require new thinking and a radical and innovative response. Let's take, let's create a new relationship between Britain and the, and the new Ireland and all of our people. During the course of this decade, from 2012 to 22, we are marking the centenaries of key seminal events which have shaped modern Irish history over the past century and have defined our relationship with Britain during this time. A relationship that's been characterised by colonialism, rebellion, partition and political division and then over the last 20 years, peace, reconciliation, renewed cooperation and mutual respect. As we approach the centenary of partition, let's not refight the old battles. This solution, this will only be solved by political leadership and we have no choice other than to succeed. The best hope for success is the dawning of the realisation that our best future is bringing the people of our island together and not apart. And that we embark on this national endeavour to transform Ireland and unite our country from this point forward. This is a defining period in our history and the history of Europe. I believe that the onus is on all of us intelligently to prepare and to shape for Ireland's future beyond Brexit. Gurmila Maugov. <laughs>